Okay, well, good evening, everybody. If I could encourage you all to take a seat, we'll begin. And I'm absolutely delighted and privileged to welcome Kate Ossimore today um, to give this next to last in our Sussex Development Lecture series for this term but actually a lecture that is far more than a normal SDL. This is, this is a really key moment. Um, so Kate is going to talk to us today about where the Labour Party has got to in a very important new set of thoughts and a new narrative for development, which is in the document that you have here and that she will be talking to us about. Kate Osamore um, is the relatively new Secretary, um, Shadow Secretary of State for International Development. She's also the Labour and Cooperative Party MP for Edmonton. But she has an interest in international development that goes way back. She originally studied international development as an undergraduate at um, the University of East London. We were just talking about how one develops one's critical perspective at that point and how it stays with one. Um, and she's had a career which has been involved at the front line of many of the development and justice issues that, that she's now engaged with in her role. So she's worked for the Big Issue magazine. She worked for 15 years in the NHS. Um, she then was elected as a member of the National Executive Committee for the Labour Party in 2014. And then in 2015, she became MP for Edmonton. Um, she had an earlier ministerial role quite briefly as Minister for, Shadow Minister for Women and Equalities in January 2016, and then in June 2016 became um, Shadow Secretary of State for Development. She's also chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Nigeria. And I think it's also worth pointing out that since being elected as an MP, Kate's been unbelievably busy, not just with what you'll be hearing about this evening, but also in using her voice as an MP um, locally and domestically to speak out consistently for the most vulnerable in society, whether that's been around gender issues, women's and equality issues, or highlighting the impact policies of all kinds will have on black and ethnic minority communities, and campaigning on a variety of social justice Justice questions, including around refugees and asylum seekers. So I can't think of anybody more really qualified to speak to the kind of agenda that is now being laid out by Labour in their new Green Paper. Um, and I now turn to Kate to tell us about what a world for the many, not the few, might look like. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> So I just want to say thank you so much, Melissa, for that very kind introduction. And it's an honour to be here with you all this evening to give the Sussex Development Lecture here at the Institute for Development Studies. There can be a few places more fitting to talk about the future of international development than here. Over many years, this institution has perhaps done more than any other to champion the simple idea that people should participate in development and that they should hold the power. That is something we can surely all get behind. I want to talk today about the state of the world and Labour's vision for what international development must be. But I want to start much closer to home. I was elected to represent Edmonton in North London back in 2015, and as an MP, my first duty is to always, and always has to be, to my constituents. Edmonton is not one of the richer parts of London. We have people from all over the world. That includes the largest Turkish-speaking community in London and a significant Caribbean population. Lots of people in my constituency struggle to get by against problems that seem so deep-rooted they're not worth fighting for. Not enough money to live on and not enough money to live in dignity. Housing that too often is too hard to find or not fit for human habitation. Benefits, public services and police numbers continually being cut. And families torn apart by this government's approach to immigration and the hostile environment. The same environment that says, if you look a certain way, we are going to assume that you are illegal until you prove to us that you are legal. 
At the end of 2017, I started to realise that I was seeing a pattern of some of the older Caribbean constituents in my office with immigration problems. These were people who were obviously British, who had spent their whole lives here in the UK and who had come here before 1973. They are now being threatened with deportation. We now know it was going on all over the country for a very long while. But it was only when I started working with Amelia Gentleman, the, br the brilliant journalist at the heart of revealing the Windrush scandal, that we were able to start telling the stories of some of my constituents. Of Anthony Bryan, the 60-year-old who had come from Jamaica almost 52 years ago, wrongly detained. Or Richard Stewart, the former cricketer who had played for Middlesex, refused British citizenship. And of Trevor Johnson, whose sister had come to me telling me of his struggle to avoid being deported. The Home Office approach meant he ended up being forced to beg in Brixton. And his brother Desmond, who was deported Jamaica, was unable to return. And when other media and politicians started to realise what was going on, the floodgates finally opened. Today, my office and I are still helping a gentleman called Lloyd Grant. His story has not been told in the media. Lloyd came here from Jamaica in 1970. He was a cabinet maker and spent much of his career working for Transport for London, all the time paying his taxes. He married a British partner and has four children but he is unable to prove his right to remain. Lloyd is now unemployed and unable to claim benefits. He is now homeless and relies on food banks. It is cases like this that I have been seeing over and over again. And it is an absolute disgrace. So why should the Windrush scandal matter for the, for the UK's future international development policy? Three reasons. First, small actions can matter. The world's, the world's problems can seem huge and unmanageable, but it starts with standing up for the individual. Stand up for people, start there, and sometimes, but not always, but sometimes the rest will follow. Second, the government simply could not understand the British public's outrage. They thought that neatly box people into categories British and outsiders, legals and illegals, us and them. Well, let me tell you, it doesn't work. It doesn't work like that. This is not the world we live in. We are all people first and foremost, not categories. In every country on this planet, we all want the same things. Yes, the right not to be arbitrarily detained or deported but also a roof over our heads, health care, decent jobs, education, solidarity with others, justice, equality, fairness, rules that work the same whether you are rich or whether you are poor. That, I believe, is also the universal promise of the new Sustainable Development Goals. The same promise made by leaders to people all around the world, be it in Bangladesh, in South Africa, in Italy, in China, or in Ecuador, in the United States, and here in the UK. But third, the Windrush scandal cuts to the very heart of the government's warped vision of global Britain. What a national embarrassment. This government, held hostage by its own, very own, hard Brexiteers, spent months talking up the Commonwealth Summit. Whitehall officials leaked that the government were treating this association of 53 equal independent nations not with the respect it deserved, but as empire strikes too. And then, as the summit started, Theresa May's government was shown to be actively deporting and targeting black Caribbean Commonwealth citizens in their 60s, 70s and 80s. People who have given their whole lives to building this country. Let us remember that the colonialisers and the companies who extracted Africa's wealth 
for centuries were British. That the slavers who took their ancestors to the West Indies deprived them of their freedom and exploited their labour were British. That the elites who got rich off their ancestors' backs were British. And that the government that invited them to, this, to the UK was a British one. But now, instead of delivering Commonwealth citizens with the preferential status that people like Priti Patel promised at the EU referendum, the British government pulls the rug from under their feet. Just think how that looks to the 12 Caribbean countries whose High Commissioners Theresa May refused even to meet. Or for that matter, how it looks to the rest of the world. In fact, Parliament's Foreign Affairs Select Committee Chair, Tom Tugendhat, a Conservative MP, has warned that global Britain risks being just an empty slogan. Well, when our government holds the hand of Donald Trump and doesn't call him out for abandoning the Paris Climate Agreement, it is an empty slogan. When our government invites the Saudi crown prince over, when it sells him 48 Typhoon fighter jets, when it refuses to ban the sale of arms being used in Yemen against civilians, and when it even offers a new £100 million aid partnership with DFID, then the global Britain really is an empty slogan. And when our Prime Minister refuses to sack Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson, a man who, let us not forget, jokes about dead bodies and business opportunities in Libya and disgracefully calls Africans flag-waving pickaninnies with watermelon smiles, then Theresa May's Global Britain is worse than an empty slogan. It is a laughing stock and, frankly, a disgrace. Let me turn to the role that international development can play and why I believe the country now faces a choice. We should be under no illusion about the sheer scale of the challenge and crisis that we face today around the world. And it matters that we get it right. Poverty remains widespread. Four billion people live on less than the equivalent of five US dollars a day. Inequality is getting worse. The richest 42 people last year claimed more wealth than the poorest half of humanity. Climate change is on the march and already creating havoc around the world. As greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise, extreme weather events like the Caribbean hurricanes or South Asia floods of 2017 are becoming more frequent. Three out of five people in the world now live in water-stressed areas. And there are other symptoms of our crisis. There is a global gender pay gap between men and women, estimated to be 32%. In fact, it is estimated that if there were equal pay and access to work, then women in low-income countries would be nine trillion US dollars better off. There are also 65 million refugees and eternally displaced people on the move from Bangladesh to Syria to Libya. I could go on that one in three women will face violence, that small state islands are paying the price of the world's biggest polluters, that corporations are able to stash taxes away in offshore jurisdictions. So how do we respond to this crisis? Well, it depends where you stand. If you believe that these symptoms are just a blip in the system and that the world is fundamentally working and fair, then you tinker. You tinker around the edges. You address one problem at a time. You hand out aid as charity rather than fixing the rules of the global economy to stop them being rigged in favour of an elite few. You react to one conflict at a time and put short-term national interests first rather than building long-term peace from the beginning. You worry about climate change and make all the right noises, perhaps even addressing its symptoms, but you stay silent on the economic model that produced it in the first place. You care about child marriage or FGM and take them on, but you, but you do it one issue at a time and dare not talk about patriarchy. 
you dare not tackle the structural drivers of gender inequality or how they interact with race, with class and with exclusion. You give a few women a chance to be entrepreneurs rather than helping women organise and win decent work for all. You hand out aid with one hand, even as you sell off public services on a grand scale, because that's what the consensus tells you is right, and it is the right thing to do. And yet, you wonder why public trust in international development falls. But there is another way. What if you started from the point that poverty, inequality and climate change are interconnected crises? That they are just the terrible symptoms of deep-rooted causes? A broken global economy that funnels wealth upwards to an elite few? A power structure that traps women in a cycle of oppression? Human-made conflicts that are complex, but that perhaps could have been avoided? if only we had put peace first. If you started from that point, then you would stop talking about aid and charity and stop defending the status quo. You would start talking about how you can solve those deep-rooted causes, however complex they look. You would start talking about social justice and transforming the global society that we all share to make it better and fairer. This is the fundamental difference between the Tory party and the Labour party. If you are in the pocket of vested interests, or if your donors are big business, oligarchs and elites that won't pay their taxes, then of course your international development policy is about a failed kind of charity, about defending the way things are and not about transforming society to work for the many. Look. I don't want to be too harsh on the Tories. They are hanging on to the 0.7%. They are hanging on to the independence of the Department for International Development. Let's be thankful for that. But it is not just the intent of the international development that they are getting wrong. It is also the management of the aid. They have put short-term national interest before poverty reduction. They have farmed out greater chunks of the aid budget to other departments that do not have the clear goals or the same standards of the effectiveness and transparency that DFID does. They have taken cross-government policy incoherence to a new height, talking up their global refugee response while failing to live up to their obligation to receive refugees in the UK. Helping low-income countries boost tax receipts through DFID, but turning a blind eye to tax avoidance made possible by the UK on the grand scale. Sending £200 million of aid to Yemen, even while British-made bombs rain down. The truth is that the rest of the government is fundamentally undermining DFID's mission day in, day out. But look, enough about the Tories and what they have done to erode trust in international development. The other route is Labour. Labour has always been the party of international social justice. We stood in solidarity with Indian independence. We supported the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. We fought for universal free health care gender justice and fair trade. We cancelled hundreds of millions of pounds of unpayable debt for the most indebted countries in the 2000s. In 1997, we set up DFID and took the radical and revolutionary step of giving it a higher moral purpose of poverty reduction. And not just serving foreign policy objectives and short-term national interests, but it is time to be radical again. It is time to be bold again. The world has changed, and our international development approach must do so. Inequality is the challenge of our lifetime, and Labour will take it on. We cannot rely any longer on the myth that trickle-down economics will somehow solve poverty. That bubble has finally burst. 
Today, over 75% of people in the global south are living in societies in which income is more unequally distributed than it was in the 1990s. We have the evidence that equal societies fare better on social indicators, are happier and more harmonious and unable to have more sustainable economies. Yet, we forge ahead anyway with channeling wealth into the hands of an elite few. It is little surprise that in almost every city in the world, extreme wealth and poverty now coexist side by side. So let me outline what we are going to do about it. I've just published a new paper, which you all have on your chairs. It sets out Labour's vision for international development and our practical plan for government. It includes 34 steps that we will take when we enter government. It is called A World for the Many, Not the Few, and it's also available online. And I encourage you all to read it. This is the headline in government. Labour will set a second twin goal for everything that DFID does, does, not only to reduce poverty, but also for the first time to reduce inequality. We will work with partner countries to explicitly measure and then narrow the gap between the richest 10% and the bottom 40%. We are going to back the SDGs wholeheartedly. They can and must be a progressive route to build a world for the many, not the few. At the core of Labour's approach is the conviction that we must do more to address the symptoms if we want to truly reduce inequality and end extreme poverty we must target their root causes. That is why Labour will prioritise action in five key areas. First, because the struggle for gender inequality, sorry, for the, because the struggle for gender equality is not going far enough or fast enough, we will launch UK's first truly feminist international development policy. We must tackle the structural drivers of gender inequality and confront power and all its abuses. We will not be afraid of challenging the patriarchy and calling it out for what it is. Second, Labour will take action to build a fairer global economy. The global economic order is failing and so we will take action to make trade deals and the rules that govern them fairer to help low-income countries clamp down on tax avoidance within and outside their borders, to invest in alternative models of ownership and to help workers in the global south organise for living wages and labour rights. Third, labour will support a global movement for public services that are universal, free and high quality. They are the best interventions that we can take to tackle inequality. We will spend more of our aid budget on health and education and put an end to this government's ideological dogma that means that support for bridge international fee-paying academies and promotion of PFI healthcare schemes overseas, even when they condemn them at home, needs to stop. Fourth, we will take action to build peace. Not all conflicts are avoidable. I understand that. But under the Tories, UK aid has been drawn into ill-thought-out attempts to deal with those conflicts. Agendas that are more to do with diplomacy, security and migration have shaped our development and humanitarian priorities. And warm words about preventing conflict are a smokescreen for arms sales and security support to states that have some of the world's worst human rights records. Fifth, we are going to take action on climate justice. We will stop UK aid money supporting fossil fuel projects, invest instead in publicly owned renewable energy and work with inst international institutions to push them to do the same. We will also develop an alternative measure of well-being and economic success alongside GDP growth. That will help us reduce the importance, pl 
placed upon GDP growth as an objective for UK funded development programmes. It is a big new vision and to deliver on it we will need to do things differently. I also outline in my paper in detail the practical steps we will, we will take and how we will use the levers of government. And I want to mention two particular commitments from among those. I am determined that in government, Labour will always seek to redistribute power to people. It must not just be development for the many, but also development by the many. Too often, the aid industry throws its weight around in disaster zones and crowds out local people and charities. Too often, the pay gap in aid agencies between the lowest earners at the bottom and CEOs at the top, or between men and women, is too big. Too often, international development agencies lose touch with the very people they are meant to serve and are no longer rooted in communities and people. We all have a responsibility to change that direction. When I talk to people in Britain and in the Global South, I am convinced that there is already a powerful global movement of people changing the world for the better. Millions of citizens, activists and volunteers, thousands of trade unions, social movements and the diaspora and faith groups. The public in Britain and every country around the world giving their time, their money and solidarity. That is the movement that must now take charge of international development in the 21st century. And my paper sets out how we will give civil society a bigger role, how we will open up DFID to the outside world and how we will invest in development, education, global learning and volunteering. Labour will also get the whole of government working to build a world for the many, not the few. We cannot tackle poverty, inequality and climate change through aid alone. Make no mistake, aid is a crucial lever. It can reach the most marginalised and save lives in the hardest settings. But tax receipts, trade rules, debt rules, remittances and foreign direct investment are more significant than ever before. We need a government that does not give with one hand and take away with the other. So we must commit to proper policy coherence across government and put the systems behind it to make it work. The world Labour wants to help build is one worth fighting for. It is one based on hope, not fear. And the truth is that Britain now has a real choice on international development. After I published my paper, Penny Morton outlined her own priorities just a few weeks later. She said UK aid is, and I quote, a shield against uncontrolled and unsustainable economic migration, a shield against pandemic diseases, a shield against organised crime, a shield against poverty and its parasitic disease terrorism. Well, let me conclude by saying Britain is sick of putting up shields. I think we're sick of building walls. I think the British people want to offer a helping hand to Rohingya refugees facing monsoon season. They want to offer a helping hand to children fighting cholera and famine in Yemen. They want to offer a helping hand to LGBT activists or women's groups or trade unionists who are fighting for a fairer world wherever they live, but are under attack and risking their lives. They want to offer a helping hand to those who are shut out of the global economic system that works only for an elite few. They want to offer a helping hand to Windrush citizens like my constituents, Anthony, Richard, Trevor and Lloyd. And they basically want to help, they want to offer a helping hand and say to the world, let's fix all of these problems together and not alone. That is what it means to build a world for everyone. And I believe it is a world that we in this room want to improve. 
So I thank you so much for inviting me here today and I look forward to our questions. For giving us a splendid talk and a compelling vision and I've got the privilege for a few minutes of having a bit of a one-to-one -one conversation before we open up to the floor um, and first of all I just wanted to say a couple of things about the welcome framing I think we're seeing of what you've just just said to us it's a framing that's about global social justice about universality, about the connections between countries, something we talk about a lot at IDS and at Sussex, the importance of inequality as well as poverty and gender justice, the importance of the SDGs, and perhaps above all, this emphasis on addressing structural causes and the systems rather than just the symptoms and the sticking plasters. And those are just a couple of areas that I'd actually like to push you a little bit further on because... One is about this, the fact that you're talking about, in effect, a rigged system, in a way, a system that is producing inequality, poverty, environmental problems, um, because power and wealth are concentrated in the hands of, of, of elites, and, mm. and they're the ones benefiting from this. But doesn't that create a bit of a paradox? Because it's those who control the power and the resources who also stand to benefit from the status quo and from not changing the system, as it were. Mm. So maybe could you tell us a little bit more about how you would see the kinds of really important changes that you're talking about coming about? What's the roles of... Yes, governments, but also perhaps the international system, maybe some of our global institutions, and then critically, the roles of maybe grassroots movements, civil society, social movements. How can they work together to bring about the kinds of changes you're talking about? Well, I suppose I don't want to frighten anybody. That's the first thing I want to say. Um, but I feel that it's important that I'm saying what I'm saying and I think it's important that we start to address the, all the issues which are showing that there are so many people that are living in poverty but how do we, as you said Melissa, how do we change that? How do we um, shift it? How do we encourage those people who are benefiting from it yeah. to see that um, they, are, they shouldn't be benefiting? One of the things we mustn't forget is that the world... I'm in, I'm in company now with the World Bank. I mean, the World Bank is actually starting to talk about inequality, which for those of us who studied um, international development, and when I studied it, it was called Third World Studies, actually, which um, wasn't a very nice framing, but that's the mm -hmm. title they used. Um, in those days, they were encouraging, you know, structural adjustment policies and narrowing down how, you know, countries produce produce. And, you know, 20 years later, 10 years later, surprise, surprise, we're, we're seeing what we're seeing, that there are countries who cannot feed themselves. They can't feed their children. They can't yeah. feed their, their, their nation. So it's how do we link in with these institutions? Well, yeah. it, once institutions, big institutions like the World Bank, start talking about the fact that their own policies are not working, they're not seeing the, the end product which they should be seeing, and now they're addressing the issue which I'm trying to talk about here around inequality, yeah. it means I need to have a conversation with the World Bank. Because yeah. once the big institutions start talking and saying, we're part of this problem, that's one wall been pulled down. Yeah. So that's the beginning, that's the beginning. Yeah. But it's institutions like yourselves where there's research taking place, where there's facts, there's figures, mm -hmm. that information needs to be given to legislators yeah. so that they're not just speaking passionately about something which they've seen in maybe their constituency. Yeah. I mean, I happen to come from a, a very unique place. I have unique eyes in a sense that I actually care about people. I don't mean to be funny or be rude, but there are some people that don't see those things. I mean, when I'm going into Westminster, into the station, there, yeah. there was a man who was sleeping homeless and um, he lost his life. He died, yeah. you know, because it was so cold. And this is Westminster. Yeah. So it's everywhere. Mm. Poverty is everywhere. Yeah. And how do we allow people yeah. to, to see that and feel confidence to speak up about it? 
So there's potentially a role not just for, well, for both action from the top down, but also from the bottom up. Yes. And, yeah. Okay. So the other area I wanted to explore a little bit more. Um, you've talked about being the first feminist international development policy, and that I think is fantastic. What about an ecological international development policy? So you've talked a little bit about the climate crisis being part of this set of interconnected crises. But um, we've got other ecological crises too. I mean, mm. just to think about some of the issues we're working on on campus. Plastics pollution, waste management, a deeply unsustainable food system, um, crises in the control over natural resources, forests, lands, water, which are often <laughs> not just causing ecological problems, but also contributing to inequality, mm. ecological inequalities, poverty. Um, so. Is there a role, do you think, for, for a vision that actually takes ecology more seriously and indeed really takes the sustainable development goals and their interconnections mm. centrally um, and perhaps links those up with inequality? What would a world of equitable sustainability, not a world of green schemes that often end up dispossessing people or not creating mm. any employment for them look like? Well, Oops, first and foremost, my list is not no way the only list. You know, we can keep adding to it. I mean, our, our, last year I went to the Caribbean after the hurricanes and I saw firsthand country, islands like Antigua that rely solely on tourism yeah. and how fundamentally, because of, you know, the abuse the island, I would say, is, is sort of undergoing because of the tourism, they, they are the ones who have been affected the most. But their properties were the strongest properties because they were being built for Western visitors. And then I went to Barbuda, which is a lot more remote and very less people live there, more sort of local inhabitants mm. were there. They, it, was, there was nothing, it was barren. There was, they didn't survive. There was nothing left. Mm. So these people now will be dispossessed and um, having to live somewhere else, which isn't their natural home. Yeah. So yeah. definitely we need to look at climate justice because because the, the, the islands that I've just mentioned, they were, they're the least polluters yeah. and they're the most affected. Yeah. So that shows that it links into you know, global justice. It's yeah. all linked in, yeah. 100%. The final thing I want to ask, because we are in IDS and on a university campus, is actually to ask you a little bit more about the role of research and evidence. Yeah. And I think it's quite obvious to those who have a look at this, this paper that it's very much based on research and evidence. Um, and one could argue that, that DFID has always seen itself as a thought leader in international development and a supporter of research and evidence-based thinking and, and paradigm setting. Mm -hmm. um, but over the last few years, I think we've seen a lot of that evidence being focused very much on what you've characterized as the symptoms and mm. the, the solutions to what works well in aid, mm. and perhaps less around the kind of analysis of the structural causes and problems that are underlying those. And it would be nice to just hear a little bit more about how you, you would see, if you were in that role, mm -hmm. a new DFID working with partners perhaps all over the world who can provide the multiple sources of research, knowledge, evidence that are needed to address the very big challenges that you've, you've laid out for us? Well, I mean, everything in the paper is research-based and yeah. um, I was really fortunate that I was able to get evidence from, you know, small organisations in the Global South to, you know, larger yeah. sort of, you know, charities in the UK and go across all kind of you know thought processes yeah. to be able to get it to, to where it is now and I'm really proud of that so I hope that shows how important I think research yeah. is yeah. but I think one of the problems with um, politicians is that they want to see the outcome during their term so if, if you're in government for five years you want to invest in things which you're going to benefit under your watch yeah. you're not necessarily going to want to invest in something which maybe the next administration which might not be you your party will benefit yeah. from so I, I mean I, I have seen that and I hope I hope that isn't the reason why but sometimes I think is that the reason why you're not investing yeah. but it's very important that we're able to have critical um, friends around us in whichever department that you're running and then they will be able to yeah. show you where there's trends where there's changes and where you need to be otherwise you're behind the trend and you're behind the curve and when you're behind that you could 
unfortunately, there's so many people, especially with diffid, so many people that are relying on you looking after them. So if you reacting after the hurricane, when you actually could have reinforced their homes so that something which is naturally going to pass their, their homes, if their home is not protected, then they're going to lose their livelihood and their lives, sadly, in some of the cases as well. So research is really important. It keeps you on your toes. It, it keeps you knowledgeable. And that's where you should be yeah. at all times. So if I was in charge, research would be safe. <laughs> well, that's very good to hear. <laughs> so, right. so, so on that very positive note, to a room full of researchers and students, let's, and also to our online audience, let's now open it up. So, um, Kate, if you're happy, just take sort of a few comments and questions at a time and then come yeah. back to you and then we'll take another, mm. another group. So, OK, we've got many. So Martin at the front here. Okay, thank you very much for our wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Okay. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in power and, and leading DFID uh, in the not too distant future. Um, a couple of questions. You know, we've seen in the, in the current aid program a very heavy emphasis upon the use of the private sector for delivering aid through impact bonds, public-private partnerships and the like, and it seems to be growing. I mean, what are you going to do to manage a transition away from that? Secondly, um, a problem which troubles us greatly globally and we think about a lot here and frankly it's, it's an area which is difficult to, uh, to find solutions to is the fact that much of aid funding is split between humanitarian funding and development funding mm. and we see all sorts of problems in, um, in managing spend effectively for inequality reduction, for peace building, for poverty reduction precisely because is split between these two big windows. What would Labour do about that? Okay. Take, Are you happy to take, take a couple more? Yeah, maybe yeah, so, so lady here. Yeah. Uh, again, thanks very much. I really enjoyed the presentation. Uh, my name is Michelle Wilson. I work for Farm Africa, and we are currently working in uh, Tanzania, Uganda, uh, Ethiopia, and Kenya. And I've got Two points, really. One, um, one around. I mean, having worked in the field for about nine years, based in a number of different countries, one of the frustrations that we found is the short-term nature of the funding that does come from the likes of DFID, yeah. and yet, you know, mixed with very, very ambitious aims and objectives, which are just not achievable in a four or five-year period. Particularly things that you're talking about, you know, which rightly so around structural changes to do with the undergirds of gender inequality. These behaviour change, change things take a long, long, long time. So, this was one question: Is is there anything that the Labour government can do in terms of rethinking about how we structure these projects and these funding cycles that can actually make it more impactful? The second question because I work for Africa, is around the role of agriculture. And um, you talked a lot about education and health, which is fantastic, but you know, this sense that um, supply can create its own demand. So where do we see the job creation? Where do you see the vision? And again, back to the question around private sector, yeah. we actually are seeing some really great results in Kenya, for example, working with Aldi, who are basically buying green beans from Kenyan farmers, and those yeah. farmers are getting money directly into their bank accounts through mobile money each week. And that is a private sector doing a really great job, yeah. much more interested in the supply chain now, I think, than perhaps five, six years ago. So I think there's real opportunities to actually engage the private sector in meaningful ways because of the whole issue around, um, yeah, I think more transparent supply chains. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Yeah. So take one more, perhaps at the back. That's fine, yeah. Cool. Thanks very much, Kay. That's awesome. Loved it. Um, my question comes uh, looking at structural causes and future developments for education. Um, I was a, as a pastor as a teacher, um, looking at the SDGs in education, um, the frustration I had was trying to get kids to be more globally minded and mm. other thinking for other people was that all the incentives are bolt-ons around a national curriculum mm. and the curriculum's about how to get a job to make money and survive, so at 18 everyone's got a me-centred mm. view of life. Mm. Um, how intrinsic are the SDGs in education now or within what you know the Labour would offer um, to make education about essentially otherness to tackle those problems from a young age, if that makes sense? Okay. Yeah. Great That's set good. of questions. Do you want to have a go at some of those? Yes, I will. Thank you, everyone. Really good questions. Um, 
so Martin, wasn't it? Yeah, so thank you, Martin. There's really, really good questions. And I think the problem we've got with the way that DFID is using their funds is they feel they have to respond to the public um, in a pitiful way. So humanitarian crisis, the public get a lot of information about how we respond to that. They're encouraged to donate, they're encouraged to feel sorry for, and I think what DFID has done and um, charities have done is they've hidden behind that and they've allowed that to be almost be the dominant um, funding stream. But we know that it should be a short-term response. The long-term response should in, be intertwined into development in the true sense of how do we develop a country? How do we allow a country to be able to, to be sustainable? But that split, I feel, has also been vehicled along by the mainstream media as well, which I haven't really spoke about, but it's how the mainstream media have a lot of control over how DFID spend their money and encourage DFID to use the media in a way which is not helpful to explain that it takes 10, 15 years for a state to, to be strong again. Or for, the gov or for the newly elected politicians to be able to have done two or three terms and to bring in legislation which will support the same people who need support when there's a hurricane. So all these things are intertwined and what I'm saying is that we do, what, I, what I'm saying is we do need to have a humanitarian response but not in spite of the fact that we should be developing a state. Whereas we've not done that, we've kind of abandoned developing states and we're more responding to humanitarian mm -hmm. response, which is important, but that has become almost the bread and butter of DFID's work. And it's not helped because the mainstream media find that easier to explain. Explaining that there are farmers in Kenya and they are build and they, they're, they're growing their crops and it takes a year, two years for it to be successful and that there's a deal that is being done with Audi and Audi's on your high street and this is where these bins are coming from. That conversation, the mainstream media is not doing. So how do we make this dominant? And I suppose what we do is we encourage Audi in, on the high street to be that voice and be proud of that voice and encourage people to work for them. But then we have the flip side to Audi where it's seen as this small chain that doesn't really do much and hasn't really got a global position. But in actual fact, it does in comparison to the larger food chains. So there is a lot of work to be done, but I think it's unraveling that and having frank conversations with the British public who actually are brilliant and really are very supportive of international development. The role of private sector, I mean, I, I, at times I may come across like bash bash, but no, not at all. There's a lot of work that can be done with the private sector and we must never forget that. There's a lot of expertise that's there and um, without them, there's the spaces which they can fill that no one else can. So it's important that we get models which are transparent, are accountable, are beneficial to the people that we're supposed to be trying to help and not beneficial to the um, the stakeholders, um, the trustees, the directors, which is what is happening, unfortunately, where we see directors being paid so much money and the recipients not actually getting anything out of it. Mm. So we need to effectively open up that conversation and explain to the public that humanitarian response is a response which should be short term. The long term should be building state. How do we build a, how do we build a state? We actually talk about what we have here, what we take for granted, and why can't we mirror that? And by mirroring that, it could take 10, 15 years for that to happen, but encouraging for that to happen. And also working with the diaspora. Diaspora has a huge role in building states back up to a confident, strong place, because what's happened, and I suppose I'm in a, in a room or in an institution where you have a lot of people from all over the world, and it'd be interesting to know how many go back, how many stay, how many end up in Europe, and this, it's a conversation mm -hmm. that has to be had. It's not a nice one, but it's one that has to be had because there's nothing to go home to. Mm -hmm. So how do, we, how do we get that done? It's, it's a lot to be done, but I, I believe we can do it. And there's a chapter about, I didn't get your name, sorry. Joe. Joe. Good question, Joe. Well, I blame Thatcher for that. <laughs> this, you know, all about me and, you know, I can make money for myself. It doesn't matter about my neighbor and, and it's not good enough. But we have to make people feel that they're connected to others. 
When there was this project which was taking place in one of my local schools where young kids had a friend in another country and they were writing to them and saying, you know, it's really important that you go to school. We've never met before, but this is what I get from going to school. And this was seven-year-olds. And um, when I attended the school, they had all this information that they wanted me to give to the <coughs> Secretary of State to say, this is what we're doing, and this is why education is really important, and this is how, why we're joined up. What happens when they get a bit older? That's the problem. That is the big problem, isn't it? But a lot of that is if we look at where people are living and the environment they're in, and if they're in a hostile environment themselves, living on a state or they're living in a road or they're living somewhere where they don't think there's much for them, they're always trying to get away from. And I think that's something which happens all over the world. But it's something we need to own and be honest about. But we need to allow people to feel they should be proud of where they're from. <laughs> And that's something which isn't being ha is not happening in the public space at all. Okay. Great. So um, there were lots of other hands. So let's take another round. Let's come to the front. So we've got <laughs> Stephanie, and then we'll come to you. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for a brilliant presentation. Um, I wanted to raise two issues which relate a lot, but I think complement a bit what you said. One is when you become minister, hopefully soon. Um, how would you help to increase policy space for developing countries? I come from a developing country and, and people that are concerned, the international institutions like the IMF, uh, the WTO, often do good things, but very often also constrain their policy space. For example, they signed a trade treaty and it tells them that they can't have capital controls. Mm. And that then, uh, you know, may lead to a crisis and, and that's really and so how for example you would think like uh, uh, previous labor ministers like Claire Short had this sort of joined up government to try and have a coordinated policy which may actually help even more than in your important aid budget hmm. and secondly I was wondering uh, what would you think of doing in terms of promoting employment in developing countries particularly the poor ones and also promoting investment, both public and private, especially for, for, for sustainable, because if we have to have this, we need urgently to have this uh, green transformation and to make societies more inclusive. That requires a lot of investment and change. And how, how do you see your role in promoting that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there's one here at the front. Um, my, com uh, my question was kind of provoked by the question about curriculum back at the class. And I was just wondering what conversation was being had in Labour about um, pedagogy and the current stratification in our education system. Um, I'm not aware of maybe what else is going on in around Europe, uh, U UK. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, but this teacher learner approach, and this could be by changing pedagogy, we may be able to bridge this gap between um, a greater sense of belonging and community, which might be a way, so through education as a top-down approach. But I'm just wondering if Labour's had this conversation about thinking about how we could endorse this. Okay. okay. Um, we'll have the gentleman at the front, and then I'll go to Sophie. Is that a question from our online audience? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm a Labour member and a climate activist, and like other people, I think, probably allowed myself a bit of cautious optimism about the next about the next Labour <laughs> um, and Jeremy Corbyn made some really kind of encouraging statements about kind of Clement Attlee style radicalism on climate change when Labour come to power um, but I'm also aware that it wasn't spoken about at the last election at all and these things can get buried when things get tough and the kind of program that you've laid out for international development is a really impressive and radical program um, but I've also seen that I mean, this is obviously not the be-all and end-all, but yeah. by the end of the first year, the climate stuff doesn't come up. I'm just wondering, is it, are you, is it, I mean, it's encouraging to see it as one of the points that is kind of laid down, but is it something that will not be put to one side when things become difficult? And is it something that is truly kind of, and whether you could maybe outline where it is that kind of that radical approach would play out through DFID on climate? So if you don't mind, Kate, I'm going to just take one more because we've got a question that's come in from our online audience. 
Uh, yes, uh, this is a question on how we um, scale up the results, so how we take action on the research on inequality and actually implement that into policy. Okay, well that's a big one. Yeah, <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> okay, okay, so I think probably, I mean we're, we're getting out of time, so if you're able to, to respond whiz to quickly, some yeah. of those, yeah. have a quick whiz through. So first and foremost, my paper is not in no way everything is on there so the fact that it's not not in there doesn't mean that it's been dropped um i hope you can hear from my speech you know that i talk quite openly about the fact that we need to look at the fact that there's small islands not producing not polluting as much as the larger islands are or countries are and they're the ones who are at the brunt end of it that is a commitment that shows that you know i've seen it firsthand as well so it's not going to drop off the agenda. Um, we need people like yourself to come forward and to be part of showing why it shouldn't come off the agenda. So that's your job, yeah? <laughs> but I appreciate what you're saying. I do appreciate what you're saying. Um, Stephanie, promoting employment. Now, one of the problems I have with Brexit, there's quite a few, but that's one of them, is how... The Commonwealth is suddenly a place where it's going to be the breeding ground for employment. But who's going to benefit? I haven't got an issue with producing jobs. Of course I haven't. I want everyone to have, you know, to reach their aspiration and to be able to look after themselves. But it has to be decent jobs. Their rights have to be protected. And everything that we have here that we take for granted that we've had to fight for, that has to be in place. So my baseline has to be how do we establish an environment which is fair first, and then we look at what can come from that. Is it that we need to upskill more people? Is it that the, the basic education after the age of maybe you know, eight years old is, doesn't exist? If it doesn't exist, then for, for me to say that it's possible for there to be this huge employment line production line it's not going to happen so we need to look at what needs to be put in first and then look at how we can build up from that so that's really my answer to that is that i don't think at the end we can't get there but how do we get there and it has to be done naturally it has to be done fairly and we also need to make sure that everyone's on board and who wants the jobs who needs the jobs who's asking for the jobs and if the voice is too dominant and it's from um that from outside of that country then we have to wonder why. That's my concern, I would say, especially around developing countries more so. Relationship in schools and teacher and child and how that works. I mean, I think I need to have a conversation with Angela Rayner around that um, because everything that we do, has, as in DFID, as a department, has to interlink with other departments so that it's not just DFID saying it because then what happens is it becomes something that only DFID needs to deal with when in actual fact it should be something that other departments are working with me or working with whoever's leading that department for it to work because that's not what's happening and that's where policy coherence really, really comes to, comes to fruition when you're working together from the very beginning and, and I think it's about looking at examples that have worked and why is it in some countries that children talk to each other or play with each other or listen to music or use other ways of learning and that's what's important how do we learn from each other actually then saying there's only one way of learning which we know there isn't there's many ways of learning great and there was one final question which was from our online audience mm -hmm. which was which is almost the summation question mm. about okay inequality you've put center stage mm. how is labor actually going to going to deliver on this big promise so if we're talking about kind of 1997 moment when when poverty really rose to rose to the fore under Claire Short is this going to be a new moment when we now have inequality just how how's that actually going to going to work well I think one of the main things which I've I, I always say to myself is looking at where it worked before and Claire Short is is one of the you know one of the most respected for me in in this field she actually challenged things in a way that at the time people didn't really understand so one of the first things I would do is look to see what Claire did <laughs> um, because unfortunately we're back in that moment we're going backwards we're not going forward but that's not enough we also need to look at the big institutions that give out the money, that you know, can 
make these heavy, un, un, not realistic constraints on countries and expecting them to be able to deliver for their people. Yeah. And also looking at democracy and is it working? Is it working in many of these countries? How much are politicians being paid? Are they accountable to anyone? Do they respond to their constituents? This is all interlinked yeah. with yeah. why there is such an unequal society yeah. in, in any given state. And I mean, I've, I meet politicians from all over the world and a lot of them get paid a lot more than me and they don't even go back to their constituencies. I mean, I wish I, I can't yeah. do that. There's no way. Yeah. I don't want yeah. to either, yeah. but, that's, but that keeps me connected. Yeah. And that's yeah. why even when I'm here and I'm talking about international development, I bring yeah. in my constituency yeah. because it represents the world. It's yeah. very, very yeah. multicultural. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, Kate, I think we're out of time, so I'm really sorry to those who might have wanted to ask questions. We're going to have to let Kate go, but please just join me in thanking for, I think, a truly inspirational talk and one that has really brought home the connections between what happens locally in our personal lives, in our own communities, in our constituencies, in your case, and what is happening across the world and how ultimately a fairer world locally and at home and a fairer world internationally are all connected with each other. So, Kate, that's been hugely inspirational and good luck. Thank you. For the next period. Thank you.